Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jerry Faber. I'm the conference director at the Institute for National Strategic Studies, and I am the uh, prelude to the prelude to the uh, introduction of our uh, kickoff speaker speaker this morning. I've got a couple of uh, quick administrative notes to provide to you. And as I go through the list, uh, the three most important uh, portions of that that you may hear later on on this are that uh, cell phones and uh, other equipment like that should be turned to either the off position, the stun, or the uh, silently vibrate uh, mode. Uh, the restrooms for this morning session and anything we have in this room are directly across the hallway from here. and. The uh, dining that will be done today and this evening will be done in this room. So aside from that, it's all nice to know that was the important things. Uh, the, uh, the schedule will not be final until we're finished tomorrow, <laughs> but we'll try to keep pretty close to that. Um, a couple of things that I will uh, talk about uh, this morning are uh, parking, if you're in a spot that doesn't have your name on it, it has someone else's name, or it has a yellow line, or it says do not park here, uh, you should stop by and talk to us later to find a place that you won't get a $100 ticket uh, if you haven't already. Uh, there are four main buildings here at the National Defense University, and uh, you will be in at least two of them today. This Marshall Hall and Lincoln Hall, which is attached just to the north of here, where we'll have this afternoon sessions, uh, and the CRRC is over there as well. And so uh, we can talk more detail about those uh, later on. Uh, transportation, there's a couple of notes on this. With respect to if you need a taxi on or off, uh, it is that you can get a phone number from those out at the reception desk. And uh, there is a place just outside between here and the Coast Guard building that it's uh, best to meet the taxi. They have less trouble coming through the, the front of the post uh, security checks and are less reluctant to arrive and pick you up if, uh, if you meet them there and we can give you the details. Uh, tomorrow, those of you who are going over to the Pentagon Memorial, uh, at 1.30 there is a, uh, a group of vans that will uh, muster out in the front of this building in the circle and they will take you over there. I think they might be fully subscribed, but if not, uh, the folks at the front desk uh, can also take care of adding your name to that list as well. Um, attendance list, if you picked one up, and I understand we ran out, we'll print off some more of those. If we uh, misspelled your name or some other vital information on there, uh, please let us know and we will uh, remedy that, at least in our database, and hopefully we'll print an addendum sheet to that. I would ask that if you have critiques either about the substance of the program or the conduct of the program that you let us know. There should be critique sheets that you have and we will circulate a, an email to all of, the, all of you who provided us with an email uh, asking you to uh, comment on the event as well and we would ask you to fill, take about three or four minutes to fill that out. When we get to the question and answer portions of things. Uh, there will be people coming to you with microphones and we would ask that you raise your hand to be identified either by the speaker or the moderator of that particular session and at the beginning of it if you would identify yourself any affiliation you might have and uh, ask a question as opposed to provide a long monologue uh, that way we can get through to everyone else uh, and if there's a particular speaker that you would like to address a question to, then please identify them ahead of time so that they're directly focusing on your question and not something else. Uh, after you've asked your question, please pass that back to the microphone handler. Uh, if you have uh, any information you need to get to you, we can give you a phone number or an email address and people can send it to us and we can print it out for you. Uh, but we don't have uh, standard issue one each uh, Wi-Fi here in the building available to, uh, to those of you who are not part of uh, NDU. Or for that matter, we don't have Wi-Fi available for those of us who are members of NDU. <laughs> uh, if you didn't bring a phone and you need to make a phone call, there are some phones uh, in the center of the section of the library, uh, the steps up to the library. So unless there are questions for me, I would uh, like Dr. Lori Fenner to uh, 
join me and I will turn things over to her without further ado or not. Ah, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> I did sneak up on you. I'm Dr. Lori Penner. I'm the director of the Conflict Records Research Center, and I see Dr. Catherine Wagner over here at this table. She's waving. She is our co-host for this morning. Um, I'd like to add my welcome to Mr. Favors, and we have some special guests here, but because our keynote speaker is here already, I'm not going to take the time. Gentlemen, please forgive me. I would like to very quickly, though, before we get immersed in the day's activities, recognize the three staffs that have helped bring this together. Many of them are outside now, but if they're inside, I'd like them to stand up. The CRRC staff, several of them are here. The Johns Hopkins University staff, some of them are here, and the conferencing center staffs. If you need any assistance at all, part of the reason to recognize them is please ask them for help. If there's anything wrong with the conference, you can blame Jerry. No, you can talk to me about anything that's wrong with that. Um, I have the honor and pleasure of introducing the acting president of the National Defense University, our own ambassador, Nancy, Nancy McEldowney. Um, you can read her bio in your programs, but I would just like to say she just joined us in August, but she has a longer history with this university as a graduate of the National War College. She has been the ambassador, our ambassador to Bulgaria, as well as deputy chief of mission in Ankara and Baku. She has worked on the Soviet uh, staff at the State Department, on the European Affairs uh, uh, Bureau, and in the Office of the Secretary, as well as working for the uh, Secretary of Defense and the National Security Council. She's earned numerous awards for her service and achievements. And without further ado, so we can get on with the day's activities, our own Ambassador Nancy Mackey. Thank you very much, Lori, for that very kind introduction, which reveals, if nothing else, how long I've been at this business. So thanks for that. It is my great pleasure to welcome everyone today to the National Defense University. And I am delighted to see that we have such a large, such a prestigious, and such an expert group here to join us today for this very important event. Now, this conference, and many other events over the past days have served to mark the very solemn anniversary of 9-11. 10 years on, the scars of this tragedy are still raw for so many of us, and I know that is true for many people in this room. The 9-11 attacks were a tragedy that transformed our country and that shaped a generation. The quest to defeat Al-Qaeda has proved to be similarly enormous and a truly vexing challenge. While we have made some significant progress, and we need to acknowledge the importance of that progress as we have degraded the leadership, we have to also acknowledge that Al-Qaeda and its affiliated movements continue to present a major threat as we saw so vividly in the threat reporting over this past weekend. What you will do here today and tomorrow, and the work that you will carry forward on the basis of your deliberations at this conference, are a crucial part of our effort to combat this threat. Your conclusions, your research, and your expertise can help us unlock the mystery, not just of what happened in the past, but what we need to do to shape the future as we go forward. Now the questions that loom over all of us and that will certainly animate your deliberations here are threefold. First, what did we really know before 9-11 and how did we overlook or misuse that knowledge. Second, what have we learned since 9-11, and how can you help us put that knowledge to maximum benefit? And third, and most importantly, how do we ensure that future research by both government and private entities is focused on the right subjects and using the right tools? 
These are fundamental, incredibly important questions that we must continue to ask and answer if we are to remain on the right path. One key part of our attempt to answer these questions is the project that we have launched here at NDU that we hope to use this conference to introduce all of you to, and that is the Conflict Records Research Center. The CRRC has an invaluable database of primary source material that will help inform sound scholarship and smart policy over the years to come. The Secretary of Defense launched the CRRC to make captured records available to civilian researchers so that together we can analyze and interpret this vast and vitally important resource. Now the CRRC staff is charged with growing this archive to include not only Al-Qaeda records, but also records from Saddam Hussein's regime. In the future, we hope and expect that records from other conflicts will be incorporated into this database for your use and use by other scholars. Though still in the early days, what we have found from this archive, from examining these records, is truly revelatory. What they have given us <coughs> is the capacity to view ourselves through the eyes of an adversary. <coughs> They are allowing us to look at what has happened and to see it as they <coughs> saw it. That is really <coughs> extraordinary and extremely powerful. Now in conjunction with this conference, we have released a number of these documents and I want to touch on just two of them which are available for you outside. The first one is a record that was captured in Afghanistan and it contains a history of Al-Qaeda as well as an after-action report of the 9-11 attacks. Think about the power of being able to look at that through their eyes. Another document describes the terrorist hijacking of an Air France commercial aircraft in 1994 six years before 9-11. The terrorist intent to fly that aircraft into the Eiffel Tower was foiled. But we know now that they had been planning for more than six years to use aerial martyrdom operations against us. And to go back to the questions that I posed to you, what did we know before 9-11 and how did we use that information? We have to continually ask that. Now, as we look at this material, what we can do with it, how you can help us and we can help you, we need to keep that tactile sense of the relevance of our work, the urgency as we go forward. I believe we have that synergy, we have that momentum, and your presence here today demonstrates that. But there's another ingredient that we must have if we are to be successful, and that is political will and political support from both the executive and the legislative branches. We need people who are prepared to ask hard questions and to challenge accepted wisdom. <coughs> Now it is our great good fortune to have someone exactly like that with us today. Someone who has been at the forefront of understanding this threat and what it will take to protect ourselves and to defeat these adversaries. It is my great honor to introduce to you that type of person who is, I think, the perfect example of what we are trying to achieve today and it is Congressman Mac Thornberry from Texas 13th District. Congressman Thornberry is the Vice Chairman of the Armed Services Committee, the Chair of the Emergency Threats Subcommittee, and a member of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. The National Journal of American Politics has described him as one of Congress's 
brainiest and most thoughtful leaders on national and defense issues. The Congressional Quarterly has called him a, quote, most respected voice on national security matters. And the people in this room know just how well deserved this praise is. Congressman Thornberry was prescient during the six months before the 9-11 attacks. Drawing on the Hart Rudman Commission's work on terrorism, he introduced a bill to establish a national homeland security agency. His work and this bill served as the basis for legislation that subsequently founded today's Department of Homeland Security. Since 9-11, Congressman Thornberry has been an advocate with those on both sides of the aisle to improve interagency cooperation. And I think most acutely significant for this audience, he has said repeatedly that he believes in and is willing to fight for the importance of developing a deeper understanding of terrorism so that we can take, together with our friends and allies, the appropriate actions to prevent its spread and to stop the threat. So please join me in welcoming one of the preeminent leaders of our country on national security questions, Congressman Mac Bonner. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for that uh, overly generous introduction. I'm, I'm probably about to dispel all of the nice things she just said about me, but uh, I appreciate it nonetheless. On, on the morning of 9-11, uh, I was one of a handful of members who had breakfast with the Secretary of Defense. Uh, the previous day, he'd given a speech about transforming the Department of Defense. He wanted to build some legislative support, so there were a handful of us who were there in the Pentagon that morning. Uh, I remember his military aide bringing him a note uh, saying that a, a plane had struck the, one of the World Trade Centers in, in New York and, and we kind of decided that we needed to get out of his way so he could go about his business and we could go about ours. As we were saying goodbye, the, uh, somebody came back to him and said, this looks like it's, it's pretty serious and, and so uh, we, we left. As I was on the 14th Street Bridge going towards the Capitol in my, in my car, I heard on the radio the second plane had been hit, uh, or the second plane had hit the second tower. Uh, and then got to my office and was watching it on television and, and saw that the building I'd left about 20 minutes before had been struck. And those of you who were here at the time remember there were also reports that there were other bombs going off around town in the State Department in various places. Uh, and then the, the Capitol Hill police come running through the uh, building saying, uh, at ordering us to evacuate. I remember somebody yelling, get out, get out, there's another one coming for us. And then so with the throngs of people, you know, you go out into the, uh, into the streets where it's chaos and you spend the next several hours in Washington gridlock trying to make contact with your wife and kids uh, to figure out uh, where they are, where, whether everybody's safe, and, and, and what you're going to do from there. Everybody who was here or in New York has a story, has their story, about 9-11 and, and what their memories are. And, and much of what my work life, and I'm sure much of the work life of the people in this room, have been devoted to dealing with the consequences of, of and implications of, of that day. But I gotta confess, I feel a little overloaded about all the 9-11 coverage over the past weekend, and, and most of the people I visit with uh, kind of feel the same way. Maybe it's because nearly all of us have kind of an emotional reaction to the tragedy of that day and you can only kind of have that emotional reaction for so long. Maybe part of it is because the media and trying to one outdo one another and keep your attention rehash and sensationalizes and just flat wears you out uh, on, on, on things. And maybe it's because a lot of us think, well, we know what happened. We, we've read the 9-11 Commission report, and, and we've seen all, all that before. So that kind of leads to the question that I was asked to address. Why do we why have another conference dealing with 9-11 and, and its consequences? 
Well, I'd offer three reasons that it's important for us all to be here and, and to share information. One is that violence from terrorists continues to be a significant threat to the country. Secondly, the Al-Qaeda movement is evolving and changing, and we've got to keep up with it, at least in our understanding. And third, I would suggest we've got to battle not just the individuals, but the ideology. And to battle the ideology <coughs> requires understanding. And then, so I might offer just a few thoughts on, on each of those things. Uh, first, it is important that we continue to study not just that day, but those responsible for it, because violence from terrorism continues to be a significant threat to our country, and it's going to be with us for a long time. Maybe it's always been that a single committed individual uh, who's willing to sacrifice his life could make a big difference in, in history. You know, certainly we all think of the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in 1914 as, as an, an incident by a committed individual that had a big impact. But I think we're at a time where an individual, or even more so a committed small group of individuals, can make a big difference. There's a lot being written these days about the super empowered individual, partly because of new communication and connectedness, partly because of new tools that are available for good or for ill, Whatever the reason, a, com a committed individual, a group of individuals, can make an even bigger difference now, I think, than, than in the past. And Al-Qaeda certainly includes a number of individuals who are very committed. You know, for a while there was the rhetoric, how oh, these are cowards. I don't think they're cowards. I just read the, uh, the book, some of y'all may have read, Triple Agent, which, which goes through this, this uh, Jordanian who responsible for the deaths of our CIA and, and security folks at the, at the host base in, in Afghanistan. Now, that guy may have taken some literary license uh, by getting inside the, the, the terrorist head, but, but still, you look at the course of his life, the, the degree of his commitment, where he went, what he did, now, he's, uh, nervousness about carrying it out, but the fact is he did carry it out. And some of our very best intelligence folks were killed as a result. These folks, no question, <coughs> at least a, a subset of them, are very committed and they're not going to back off anytime soon. They're also innovative. The ambassador mentioned uh, now we get documents that shows their interest in flying planes in, uh, and using them as weapons. But I believe, other than a couple of novels, there really wasn't anyone in the intelligence community or otherwise who speculated about terrorists using planes as weapons before 9-11. And as we well know, they continue to explore other ways to attack us. Uh, some of the most recent reports involve uh, work in, in implanting bombs inside bodies and, and the challenge that that presents to us all. Uh, a lot of my time these days is spent in the world of cybersecurity. There is no doubt they are exploring options through the internet on ways to have real world effects uh, so that cyber terrorism uh, could be a, a real possibility. So they're committed and, and they're innovative and at the same time there is no doubt that they are committed to, uh, to acquiring and using if they can get them weapons of mass destruction. Obviously the ultimate would be a nuclear weapon, but even a radiological weapon, a chemical or biological weapon uh, would, would have enormous uh, consequences. Not long after 9-11, Kissinger said, this is not aimed at our policies, this is aimed at our existence. And so I don't think any of us should, should doubt the seriousness of the threat that, that uh, this movement continues to pose to the lives of individual Americans and what they are attempting to achieve in, in the broader sense. And the rest of the story is, the media brings it into our living rooms and, and makes it very real to us wherever it happens around the world. So it adds in some ways to their power, to their leverage, and, and all of that combined 
I think, makes violence from these uh, from terrorists a significant threat to the country that will continue. The second thing, though, is that Al Qaeda is evolving. It is different today than it was 9/11. It is different today than it was May 1st, 2011. And it will be different a year from now or, or two years from now. And one of the reasons I think these documents the ambassador talked about are so valuable, as, as she said, it allows us to look at us through their eyes and to see part of the evolution, how they have changed. And hopefully that can give us insight on the trajectory about how they will change in, in the future. Uh, some of it, it seems pretty clear, as we have put more pressure on core al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and, uh, and Pakistan. We have had the rise of the affiliates. Two of the most prominent uh, attacks or attempted attacks against us came from al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and we know from their public statements, as well as other information, that they are very determined to try to attack us here at home, and they will continue to pursue that. But we also have uh, Al-Qaeda in the land of the Maghreb, uh, which has not been a particularly effective terrorist organization, but they're right there with all the turmoil in Libya, uh, with, uh, with a variety of weapons that probably are getting out into the wrong hands. And so taking advantage of that chaos and that increased weaponry, weaponry may well make AQIM a more potent threat in the future. And it goes on. We're watching uh, uh, events in Somalia. We're, we're watching uh, other organizations, uh, LAT and the rest. So we see these affiliated groups that seem to be gaining in stature. Uh, at the same time, there is, there is this pressure on the core. But, but what we've also seen, of course, is the rise of the individual. Uh, sometimes motivated, encouraged, radicalized, maybe even by the internet, uh, a, a gigantic challenge for our security and intelligence folks. But the point is, it's changing. It's different than it was 9-11. And I think just as is true with, uh, with the terrorist movement, it is also more generally true with national security. In his book, uh, 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 War Made New, Max Boot looked at warfare from 1500 on, and one of his conclusions was keeping up with the pace of change is getting harder than ever, and the risk of getting left behind are rising. Today, there is no room for error. And so the importance of study so that we can see the way that Al-Qaeda is changing and hopefully be able to get ahead of that curve uh, through conferences like this, through documents like are made available is, is greater than ever. Third point I'd make, though, is that we've got to battle the uh, ideology, not just the individuals. And the fact is, of course, Al-Qaeda and these associated groups have an ideology. It can be both a good and a bad thing. It can be a, a good thing, from our sense, in that it enables us to use it against them. Whether they are inconsistent with it, we can decrease their credibility in the world. And so it gives us an opportunity to fight this ideology when, when, they have, when, they are, when they have one, when it's not just criminals looking out for their self-interest. But the downside of it is that the ideology lasts beyond individuals. So you remove bin Laden, but the, the ideology allows the movement to continue to expand, maybe even to grow, as I mentioned, over the Internet and, and through other ways. So this, I, the fact that they have an ideology, I think, is somewhat a mixed bag. But, but I'm struck by the fact that we've dealt with ideologies before. It was part of the war plan dealing with communism that we had to battle the ideology. In, in their book, uh, Winning the Long War, Carafano and, and Rosenwig talked about three lessons from the Cold War. And one of them is, to win a long-term war, the fundamentals are the same. You gotta have sound security, economic growth, a strong civil society, and a willingness to engage in a public battle of ideas. Now we may have problems on more than one of those fronts, uh, but that, that would be another seminar. Uh, but, but, but the point is we've gotta be willing to engage in a public battle of ideas. They go on, go on to argue that, that to do that, you've gotta first understand the enemy, Secondly, you've got to delegitimize his view of the world. Third, you've got to offer a counter view 
of the world. And fourth, you've got to demonstrate the will to prevail, something, again, the ambassador mentioned uh, in, in her remarks. Uh, and, and this is an area where, in my opinion, we have been, uh, as a government, woefully short. To me, the aha moment came shortly after 9-11 when I realized that we would never be able to kill or capture all of the terrorists that were out there. And that if we tried, we'd probably end up creating more than we removed from the battlefield. We have to engage in this war of ideas. And on many fronts, it's not just about trying to get a better broadcast out there and say how great Americans are, even though that was kind of the approach at the beginning uh, of, of the efforts that, that have been made. It's not marketing or simplistic slogans. It starts with a much deeper understanding of the target audience, the cultures we are trying to influence, and it uh, a lot of times cannot possibly, of course, come, come directly from us. But, but it's got to include an understanding of the networks of influence within these societies. I've been to Afghanistan a couple times this year. One of the most promising developments, it seems to me, and in the, eye, in the opinion of many, are the village stability operations that largely are, are being run by our special operations forces who live in the villages, uh, work with the villagers to develop village level security. Uh, you understand the networks of influence because they are living there in the villages and helping do it on, in their way, in a way that's consistent with their culture, and it's having tremendous impact. Now, there's going to be arguments about to the extent to which it is scalable throughout the country and so forth, but my point is real success starts with real understanding, and it's not just book learning. You've got to understand, the, in this case, the way the tribes work, the networks of influence, what their anxieties are, what means more to them, what their value structure is. Uh, those are not things that come easily, and yet that's exactly the sort of uh, under, deeper understanding that'll be that is required for us to successfully engage in a war of ideas, uh, particularly because it's got, to, it's got to extend in a variety of places around the world, and what works in one place does not necessarily work in but I would uh, cite for you, uh, among other things, Zawahiri's letter to Zarqawi, Zarqawi in Iraq in 2005. If you have any doubt, he said more than half the battle is taking place in the battlefield of the media. They understand that. I'm not sure that we understand it and are prepared to deal with it in, in that level. So if, if you kind of step back and, and, and look, uh, I think it reemphasizes to me at least, the importance of study and understanding of terrorism and generally in national security. I agree with Colonel John Boyd of Oodaloop fame who says it's people, ideas, and hardware in that order. And I think that is true for our national security. I'm also struck by David Ben-Gurion's quote that the most dangerous enemy to Israel's security was the intellectual inertia of those who are responsible for that security. So I think that uh, puts a lot of the responsibility back on us. Uh, I need to make a few comments probably on my own branch of government uh, and, and how Congress can help or hurt in this wider effort. I think the rule for Congress on many things is first, do no harm uh, following the doctors. I'm not saying we always do that. But I think when it comes to developing uh, national security understanding, having the tools to take that understanding and apply it, uh, the first rule should be do no harm. But secondly, I think Congress can and should and hopefully is trying to aid in that understanding. We're having a series of hearings, for example, in the Armed Services Committee, looking back at these last 10 years, what we've learned. Uh, what, uh, what it tells us about the future of having, we had a former chairman of, and vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, last week, for example, and these, these things will continue. Uh, we're having a hearing next week in, in my Emerging Threats Subcommittee about the first 25 years of the Special Operations Command. Has it worked? Is its charter right? Do we need to recalibrate a little as we look back uh, the last 25 years, and especially the, the, the use of, of, next, of the next 10 years. Uh, 
So, so Congress can help improve understanding, but also Congress can help prevent the sclerosis of our national security establishment. And it seems to me that that is one of the big challenges that our country faces. When you have as big a bureaucracy and organization in national security as the United States of America, they tend to be uh, big uh, battleships or carriers that are pretty hard to turn and are not necessarily known for their agility and, and flexibility. So Congress has played a role in organizational reform, uh, whether it's the Department of Homeland Security or the creation of the Director of National Intelligence. Y'all may have different opinions about how well any of those have worked out, but the point is that sometimes a little push uh, helped by a commission from Congress is necessary. Of course, everybody cites the Goldwater Nichols uh, example from several years ago. And a number of us think that, that some sort of formulation, for, uh, in a, as is called the Goldwater Nichols for the interagency, is something that uh, should be pursued uh, to try, as the ambassador said, to bring all the tools of national power and influence to the table. Um, obviously, the key role of Congress these days is money. And uh, in a incredibly tight and tighter budgets, um, the importance of uh, figuring out what tools we need going forward is going to is greater than ever, I think. Um, and again, that brings us back to understanding and study. And, and if we have to make choices on what's going to be the most effective tools in the future, we need to be sure we're investing in those, even if some other things uh, may not be funded to the extent we would we would like. So the bottom line, I think, is that all of us involved in national security have been given a precious charge. It includes the safety of our citizens and the freedom and opportunities that our kids are going to enjoy and, and the future of our republic. Uh, discharging our duty will require the best from, from each of us, and that includes the intellectual preparation of the battlefield. And it's my hope that this conference can significantly contribute to that, especially in the area of terrorism. So thanks for having me. And I'll be happy, if, if time allows, to, for questions, comments, or suggestions that y'all have. Thank you very much, Congressman Thornberry. Uh, the Congressman has generously accepted the invitation to do some Q&A with us. Please follow the rules that Jerry set out for you, though. Uh, the folks with the microphones will get those to you if you'll raise your hand or stand up. And please uh, tell us who you are, where you're from, and please state your question succinctly. Anybody with a question? We have a microphone coming for you, sir. Good morning, Congressman. Thank you very, thank you very much. Sebastian Gorka, College of International Security Affairs here at NDU. Uh, it's very um, <clears throat> it's reassuring to hear your comments on the need to take this war to the ideological level, to uh, re reassess uh, fighting not just in the kinetic sphere. Could you give us your assessment of the last 10 years and why we have not been as effective as we could have been, in your opinion, in the less kinetic aspects of the war against Al-Qaeda, why it's taken us so long to get an appreciation for this aspect of, of the war. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and I, I, um, uh, I'll, I'll probably think of some more reasons after I'll, let, I'll leave. But one is that we've had trouble characterizing what this conflict has been about. Is this a criminal action where bin Laden's the bad guy and we're out to get him? Is this a war? What, what sort of, of, of conflict is this? And, and it, not having as clear an enemy with a border makes it a little more difficult, I think, um, than, than it was maybe with, and I'm, I'm thinking in my mind the comparison with, with, with the communists. Secondly, though, um, it's not something we do very well and we're suspicious of it because the first word that comes to mind is propaganda. Um, and obviously, we're, we're very concerned about that. As a matter of fact, we passed a law uh, in the 50s that prevents uh, the U.S. government from making broadcasts that could reach uh, U.S. citizens. smith munt Act, how does that apply in the age of the internet? Uh, it doesn't, it can't. Uh, but, but, but still, that suspicion that we have of, of government uh, propaganda is, 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 is part of it too. And, and thirdly, I would say it's our impatience. 
we think that we can go just take care of these guys and it's done and it's over, we you know, wipe the dust off our hands and move on to the next thing. Uh, we are, it, it is one of our virtues and our vices that we are an impatient people. This will be a long struggle in any ideological sort of, of battle uh, is, and we don't do that very well. Uh, I hope we're learning patience that, the, the, that this threat will not disappear. It should not dominate us, but neither should we ignore it. Uh, and, and so, I don't know, those, those are three reasons I think it has been hard. And, and, and as a consequence, we have not had the government structures in place, uh, uh, the coordinated activity that I think is, is necessary to fight this battle. We have a gentleman over here. Over here. Good morning. Uh, is this on? Uh, my name is Riley Hennessy from the Canadian Department of National Defense, and I thought you had a great point about uh, Congress maybe learn, needing to learn about the security and understanding the enemy and allies. And I wondered if, uh, obviously, the threat of Al Qaeda and its affiliates are, is not just to the United States; it's to Canada, Britain, France, Germany. And if, if you, as a as a congressional member, reach out to other uh, parliaments or or congresses across uh, the Western world to talk about maybe encouraging other parliaments and and congressional people to understand the threat as well. It's not just uh, a United States thing. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a great point. And there is some of that interaction going on. For example, uh, one of my colleagues, Sue Myrick from South from North Carolina, has a, a parliamentary group with the EU where they meet occasionally here and there uh, once or twice a year to talk about terrorism issues. Uh, certainly, you know, as, as we travel, um, it is, at a very high on the agenda for, for a lot of our allies. But, but I think you make a great point. Not all wisdom is going to be in the United States, and it is only in a concerted way can we understand, and certainly in a concerted way, that we can take action <coughs> together. I'm Greggy Dunn. I'm from uh, Naval Warfare Development and uh, Red Sail, uh, regular warfare analyst. <clears throat> but my question is, uh, recently I was able, to, I was invited, a friend became an American citizen. And I sat in the courtroom and there were people there from every country around the world. And I was amazed at the enthusiasm of becoming an American citizen. And I would ask and question, how are we using, or how are we, yeah, how are we using our new citizens to America to help fight this ideological threat? That's my question. It, it's a great point. We, we have raised a number of times in the Intelligence Committee uh, because you have people with a lot of the understanding that I was talking about, not just the language skills, but also the deep understanding of the societies they come from, the anxieties, the, 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 the ways of influencing those societies, and yet, it is incredibly difficult to get any sort of security clearance for those people in order to help enlist them, uh, even sometimes when they volunteer. And I know you've got to be suspicious about volunteers sometimes. But, but the point is, we make it too hard to bring together all of the resources that this multifaceted, demographically uh, uh, diverse country can, can bring to bear. And, and, uh, Needless to say, this also plays into some of the uh, uh, radioactivity of the immigration issue, which is also, you know, a, a factor here. But, but, but just a, a simpler fix would be make it easier to get at least secret clearances for for some people who may be new immigrants. And I think there is a big resource there that we could definitely draw more on. Thank you so much, Ambassador, thank you all for coming to this opening session. Um, as our guest leaves, if you'll pause for just a second, we're going to take a short break. We'll still give you 10 minutes, but we want to get on with our first panel because I think you'll be very, very interested in what those folks have to say, too. So thank you very much. Uh, Jerry might have a word for you. No, he's okay. Okay, I think they've successfully exited. Thank you for your attention. And uh, about five or 10 minutes, please come back.